After so many episodes analyzing Life is Strange, I was going to write a, a video on dialogue, and I was going to do a video on relationships, but when I tried to record them, I talked myself hoarse because I kept talking about theme instead. So we're going to talk about theme instead. Now, theme is difficult to talk about because you sound like a pretentious dork, but uh, we're going to try and keep it concrete. I'm going to show you why you need to know what your theme is in order to write good dialogue and to write good relationships and compelling characters, because uh, this is the secret. And I'll go into more detail in dedicated videos later, but for now, let's go ahead and uh, talk about the clearest and most obvious example of theming that we can find in video games, and that is Star Wars. Now, the movies and books are a little bit more diverse, but with the, any video game about a Jedi, they all have the same theme falling and redemption, the difficulties in, in trying to find your way, uh, the, the challenge of what happens when you fall and the struggle to regain your path once you've lost your way. So you can think of that as a sort of a cyclical theme. It's an arc that can repeat. And uh, a lot of themes are like this. So for example, in Star Wars, this might be the, the arc. And because it's cyclical, you can just staple it onto its own end if you need to. So this is a really, really easy to understand and super clear theme. It's about falling and about redemption. But there are a million ways that you can discuss that because there are a million different kinds of falling and there are a million different kinds of redemption. And that's why it remains endlessly interesting. And that's why it's so powerful. Let's go ahead and talk about uh, Knights of the Old Republic. If you've never played them, I'm going to be spoiling them. Um, but uh, I'm also going to be trying to tell you about characters that you probably won't be very familiar with. Well, let's, let's try it out anyway. The first character is the most obvious example. We're going to call her Kreia because that's her name. She's basically the evil emperor, emperor, except for she has a lot more dialogue and she doesn't go, No, 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 quite so much. Here's our Kreia. Now, if you've played KOTOR 2, uh, Korea probably remains a pretty significant memory. When I asked people what their favorite relationships in video games were, a surprising number of them said Kreia. Uh, that's because her interactions with you are quite varied and interesting and complex, and they never don't make sense. They always fit into the game world very, very well. How can you write a character that has such a complex set of, of arcs, uh, such a complex interweaving, uh, but let it still make sense. Even even at every stage, Kreia's machinations always work perfectly with your own experiences. They never feel like they're out of the blue. They never feel like they're really betrayals or distractions. How do they feel? How, how, does, how do they always feel so natural? Well, that's because Kreia is uh, going through the exact same thematic arc as you in the exact same place at the exact same time. So if we talk about the player's arc, the player starts here. You don't know that you've got this backstory yet, but this is where you start. Kreia, on the other stand, on the other hand, starts uh, here. <laughs> now, because of this, when Kreia is moving along her arc, she's always moving at the same pace in the same direction as you. So whatever machinations she decides to use, they fit in perfectly with your arc. And similarly, anything that you want to do fits in perfectly with hers. So every time that she brings something up or she tries to use you in some different way or she tries to teach you some new uh, philo philosophical element, it, that happens to be the exact moment that you, the player, are interested in getting taught that and get interested in doing that thing, interested in learning that thing because the two of you are going through the same arc. Now you're painted in different colors. Kreia is a dark side um, uh, evil lady, basically, and she wants to regain all of her evil powers. You are uh, normally a light sider, and you're trying to learn your way through in the first place. So even though you theoretically have very different goals, your themes are very tightly locked together, and that means that any time you want to write dialogue for Kreia and the player, it turns out that they want to move in the same way at the same time. So they are perfectly attuned to each other. And the friction that they have is, uh, is just enough 
to, to propel both of them down their arc at the right rate. Great. All of the characters in KOTOR are like this. All of the Force-using characters, at least. So, if we wanted to talk about it, for example, here is the player's arc. You might have a lot of other characters in the game, and they might have arcs like this. Or like this. Uh, yeah. Or like uh, this. Whatever we need. We can have any sort of characters that we want. And if you think about the way in which the various Jedi characters are used, the various Force-using characters are used, you can see that they all have this same kind of arc, just a different shade. They have a different um, underlying emotional resonance, and they're generally off phase. They will fall or rise at a different rate than the player. Also, because they're not the player, you can play around with their arc pretty freely when it's off screen. So if you decide that uh, what you really want to do is have this character come back, there's no reason you can't have her have a second arc that is ludicrously fast, because the player is not paying attention uh, that closely to her. The player is mostly attuned with their own arc, but the overall structure of the arc still pulls the player and the character together in a way which lets you really, really easily write compelling dialogue, create compelling relationships, and have characters that remain memorable because they're doing the things that the player is thinking about. Not necessarily thinking of doing, but thinking about it in terms of whether they're important. There's also a bunch of supporting characters like Zalbar. Do you remember Zalbar? No? He didn't go through this arc because he didn't need to. He was just a supporting character. Um, supporting characters like HK-47, you probably do remember them, but that's because he was cleverly written and not because he was a memorable part of the arc of the game. Uh, we can talk about that more later too, but not in this video. Uh, we're going to instead talk a little bit about the sort of reasons that this actually works much more deeply than, than you might think. Because I haven't been clear enough, I don't think. The theme really drives absolutely everything that you do. The reason that the player can have deep and meaningful relationships, deep and meaningful conversations, um, this it's because of the way that the two characters are moving on their own arcs. So if you wanted to, if you so let's say let's say this part here, um, it doesn't require the. I'm, I'm just doodling, so don't think of this as some sort of concrete, you know thing you have to remember on spreadsheets or whatever. But let's just talk about this one point here. The player is moving up through his arc. He's learning or she's learning new skills and also new philosophies, uh, new new elements to what power means. And if you wanted to, you would use this as a very good example. Someone that's slowly falling, but they're falling for the exact reason that might trip you up if you're not careful. And you can have that be a very powerful moment. The player has gained new powers. Force lightning, maybe. And what happens? You find a character that's misusing force lightning or some other power. And uh, and they're like, this obviously I uh, I have this power. And therefore I can use this power. There must be, a, you know, I'm there's a reason I have this power. And therefore, you know, I'm going to use it like this. Or I, I can do no wrong. Uh, and in that way, you can use that moment to teach the player a little bit of the philosophy of your particular arc or your particular theme. Like, you know, light side versus dark side, common theme. You don't do it by simply having someone pull up in a, you know, a golf cart and say, dark side, bad. Instead, you show someone who's falling. In theory, you could show someone who's falling at any point. I mean, why not have a character that's falling down here? You know, I want to... Want to do a little, little uh, right up at the beginning? Sorry, right up at the beginning here. Uh, I've just learned my very, very first force power, and it's like uh, plus one strength. This guy's abusing his force powers. Well, no, that's not going to work because you're not ready. It's not the right moment in your arc to learn that force powers can be as much of a hazard to your arc as they are a help. It's too early on, and instead, what you see is you see someone that's learning faster than you, and you're like, oh. I also just learned uh, strength, force strength, so let's go on this little side quest together. Oh, hey, I just learned, like, force lightning repellent with my sword, and I can deflect blaster bolts, and oh, hey, I just learned... And now you're like, okay, 
Now I'm really, really jealous. And that's great because that's another thing. That's an earlier thing. You got to, you know, you're going through to try and keep your path. You got to learn that jealousy can lead you down to the dark side. So it's all based on this theme. And you can always figure out a way to weave your character relationships, your dialogue. Uh, you can weave all them into the theme if you know what your theme is. You don't have to have a map like this. You don't have to have someone doodling on a screen and drawing little scribbles. All you have to realize is what your theme is. And you need to make sure that your characters serve that theme at the right time. Let's talk about another example. This is sort of the opposite example, the 100% opposite direction, and that is the Mass Effect series. So yeah, we'll just go ahead and stick with sci-fi for the rest of uh, this video. Uh, the Mass Effect has no exact theme. It has an overall concept. Its concept is the wonders of the universe, the wonders of finding new things. Not all wonders are good, but if you think of Star Wars as having a thematic arc, Mass Effect has a thematic pie. And instead of characters wandering through and going through the same arc at different times, Mass Effect just has a character that takes various slices of the pie. So if your theme doesn't have an arc, you can always try to instead break it up into facets like this. And so in Mass Effect, you've got the character that's all about uh, exploring the wilds and be like, wow, I really, I really love all of the cool things that we can discover by examining the universe. But then you've got uh, a pink helmet lady and she's like, no, if it's not human and I don't understand it, then it's just too dangerous. And then you've got uh, Kaiden who's like, yeah, uh, it turns out that if we kind of go off half cocked, people get really sick. Uh, but they also get super psychic powers. That's cool, right? And then you've got the Turian, and he's like, I'm going to calibrate some weapons, and also, uh, whatever the wonders are that are out there, we can't get mired down in, uh, you know, in, in politics. We have, to, we have to do what's right regardless. And each of the characters, in the first few games at least, represents a different slice of the concept of Mass Effect. And that's a very powerful way to do it, uh, it's also very popular these days. Dragon Age is also written like this. Um, it's very easy to write something like this because all you have to do is find something cool and then come up with a bunch of different ways that it's cool. And each of those characters is that each of those ways is a character. And this is great because uh, it allows you to weave these characters in whenever you need to opportunistically. You can even have the player choose which characters to bring. And that means that whenever you want to bring the character in to talk about something cool, you can. There's no arc, so you can just do whatever you want whenever you want, uh, and it will work out because it's all thematically relevant. Downside of this is that you're going to have a really hard time writing really, really meaningful relationships and dialogue simply because there's no arc. You're going to have a tough time having the characters moving in the same direction as the player. Mass Effect gets around this by using some relatively clever pacing dynamics, but it's not going to be as powerful as using one character's arc to drive uh, the player's arc. This is also made more difficult because the player in these games is a cipher, um, and they don't actually have any personality uh, or scripted elements to them, so it's difficult to, to really script that in. Um, but this is an approach. Now, what about uh, everyone's favorite game, at least the one that I've been examining for so long? What about Life is Strange? Life is Strange is also an arc, but it's a little bit different because it isn't an arc that all of the other characters also echo along with you. The, the arc in Life of Strange is the arc, and there is a theme, but the theme is so core that there is nothing else. Uh, well... At least that's the theory. So the theme is how far will Max or you go to save a friend or to be with a friend or a lover or whatever. 
That is a powerful set of questions, and it has a built-in arc, because obviously the answer is further than we are at the moment. Sort of like, uh, uh, you know, you're playing cards, and hit me, hit me, hit me. So you have an arc, yeah, like this. Oh no, shoot, everything exploded. <laughs> and this is the arc of Life is Strange. All of the other characters aren't there to have an arc. They don't, they're not mirroring this arc. Instead, all of the other characters exist solely to provide you with sharp punctures at the specific moments that you need them to. Um, whether it's supportive or, or hazardous, you want the characters to be there to pull the player in the correct direction. Very similar to the way that the Star Wars characters do. But instead of being on an arc that happens to intercept yours, they are there just to show you the side effects of what's going on and whether or not, you know, you can, uh, whether or not you're proceeding correctly or not. Easy example. We're down here and we are just trying to get started with the concept of going somewhere to save our friend. So our friend gets in trouble. She gets shot in the bathroom and we decide that we're going to, uh, to rewind time and save her. Well, her getting shot in the bathroom is specifically a chance for us to move up. Uh, we, ha we have decided that, yes, we are going to go further than not doing anything. We are going to be with our friend further than nothing. <laughs> and that's great. But the thing is that we also have to start moving in other directions to keep this, this thing running along the rails cr properly. So then we have more events where we're shown that doing that is uh, not great. So we get yelled at by... The, uh, the, the principal, we get yelled at by um, Chloe's dad. Uh, and now that I think about it, it's kind of miraculous he didn't see her coming out of the bathroom. Anyway, uh, these are not some, some big thing. They're just enough to get our vector going properly. And we learn that when we are going to go out of our way to save our friend or to save anyone, there's going to be some blowback. Sometimes that's in the form of powers, like here we decide that we're going to save Kate from jumping off the roof. And we said, yes, we're going to be, we're going to be more than that. We're going to go ahead and try very, very hard. And the universe says, well, you know what? You're going to have to live with that um, decision because the powers aren't going to support you. We're going to blow out the powers halfway through and you're going to have to work at it. And that'll get us back on the vector properly. So as we work forward in the game, we learn that every time we decide to go up a step, we have to deal with the consequences until at the end, in theory, we learn that the last consequence is we destroy the entire town, including everyone Chloe has ever met. Once again, I'm not, you don't need a diagram. I'm drawing something kind of scribbly here, but you do not need a diagram. The basic concept is how far will Max or you go to be with a friend and in answering that, you will naturally learn that there is a certain pattern because the answer is, yes, I will go further or no, I will not go further. And either way, all you need to do is adjust that back into your, uh, into your proper pacing. So if the player says, yes, I am willing to go further than this to save Chloe, then you say, great, now I'm going to throw stuff at you because uh, you, have, you have decided to take to to act and now you will face the consequences and these consequences are the reasons that you should be thinking twice about how far you'll go to be with a friend and on the other hand if the player says i don't really feel like going that far well that's the answer that's the, the answer is you will not go any further than that but maybe that's because she's not enough of a friend so you have these scenes where you bond with chloe you know chloe's like hey uh <laughs> Uh, this is super cool bonding sequence stuff. Let's go. Let's go jump into a uh, a pool, and you can sleep at my house, and we will have some really great scenes. Uh, let's bond here, uh, where I support you uh, in in your endeavors un unrelentingly, uh, and you know we'll bond here, where I forgive you for being a total jackass for five years, uh, and we'll bond here, where I forgive you for killing my dad, and so that is how it works. It's just this, this balancing match where you're trying to stay on theme with the proper pacing the entire time. And to me, the reason that I like arc pacings 
is because they have such or arc themes is because they have such a solid pacing basis. You know where you're trying to go, you know what you're trying to do, you know what you're trying to accomplish. And it's just a matter of figuring out which characters can support you, whether that's in terms of a relationship or a dialogue, whether they're going up or going down, whether they're pulling you forward or pushing you back. Those are easier questions to ask once you know what's going on. Anyway, I'll be talking about dialogue and stuff in a, in a later video. I'm not 100% sure that this video is uh, any good. So let me know what you think of it because... Uh, kind of winging it, kind of a, a pretentious little video, but that is what I think about themes. They're super important. Oh, oh, I forgot. You can invent your own themes. Yeah, guys, just um, important, important announcement. You do not have to use a canned theme. Let's go ahead and say that you are making a fantasy game and you want your fantasy game to be, you know, uber cool and slick. What's the theme of your fantasy game? There's no generic fantasy theme. Let's say that your fantasy theme is that is is uh, someone must sacrifice to protect everyone. Sort of a Spock-like theme. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Right. That's perfectly good. What does this mean in terms of your game? Well, it means that you're going to talk about sacrificing in order to protect people. And you're going to talk about what happens when you don't, because it's someone must. So if they don't, something bad happens. And you're going to talk about the scale of this sacrifice. And this can be a very, very compelling theme. Let's say that you're at the very beginning of the game, right? And you're like, oh, I'm in the beginning village. Oh, shoot, there is like a giant castle uh, full of zombie ninja demons. They're all coming out. Oh, no. Um, the answer to someone must sacrifice to protect someone is to protect everyone is what are you going to do at this stage? Well, you have a couple of options. One option is you stick with the player and you have the player make very small sacrifices or see other people sacrifice themselves to save the village. Another option is that you have the player play as a demo character, um, maybe maybe the main character's mom or something, and they go in and they sacrifice themselves to close off the castle and save the village. Either way, what we're establishing here is that this is a game about protecting people, even if it hurts. And then we can be like, okay, well, that was a little bit too uh, straightforward. So now what we're going to do is we're going to have an event where someone refuses to sacrifice in order to protect everyone. And in turn, everyone suffers. So, you know, the village uh, survived the attack, but there's something screwy going on. And uh, in order to protect the villagers, someone has to go out of their way um, to, to sacrifice. Maybe the mayor was super corrupt and was working with an evil wizard, and he has to, he has to take the fall. He has to, he has to, um, he has to personally go out there and uh, and refuse the evil wizard and send them back or whatever. But instead, he chooses not to, and the village is consumed, uh, and he dies too. Why not? And in this way, we can move up and down and around up our path. Uh, and it's pretty easy to try and get this pacing right. All you have to do is think about whether or not the player is moving a little bit too fast or a little bit too slow or is at the right place for your own personal preference and this is something you can just feel out you don't need to have a diagram so you can basically just repeat these concepts in different colors all throughout until the end so you might be thinking at the end the player sacrifices himself to save or herself to save the world uh no 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 that would be like here <laughs> at the end the player has to let their their favorite other character sacrifice themselves, their romance option, because that's way, way worse than sacrificing yourself. So it's very easy to plan out this kind of arc once you know what your theme is. And of course, this doesn't have to be your theme. There are a million themes that you can do. For example, um, you can only win with diversity, you know, ragtag group that comes together to fight against all odds. 
um, and everyone's weird and different. And that would be something that you could show very well throughout the course of the game by like having a village that was all, you know, one type of person and some kind of super staid village. And then some refugees show up and it's difficult to convince the village to get them to join, you know, to, to let them settle in. Uh, but once you do, the village brightens up and immediately becomes much more vigorous and, uh, uh, and, and, um, life, lifeless, or life, life full, vigorous. <laughs> the point is you can think of all of these things, these plot elements, whether it's conversations, relationships, characters, plot events, scenery, weapons, enemy design, dungeons, you can always bring it back to theme. And it's super, super powerful. It's just a shame that everybody thinks it's too pretentious to worry about. Anyway, that's my ramblings on theme. Let me know what you think below. And uh, uh, yeah, sorry I rambled on. <laughs>